This is Kumiko Makihara, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Sherry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Kumiko Makihara. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. There are handy links over in the sidebar on the right-hand side where you can subscribe to the show. You can find uh, all of the archives in a handy little drop-down list. Or there's a search bar where you can search for your favorite author and see if they have been on the show in these past uh, more than 400 episodes. Thank you to our sponsors for uh, allowing us to do this. And we've got some new sponsors coming on. Daniel Kenny, my favorite middle grade author, is just doing amazing things right now. He is publishing like a madman, uh, but he's putting out excellent, excellent books. Uh, I buy his books for my nieces and nephews uh, all the time. My, my kids are a little older now. Uh, but my nieces and nephews, I buy Daniel's books and put them in their hands. They are top shelf quality and really, really fun books. Uh, there's a link to Daniel's uh, Amazon page in the show notes, and uh, we're going to be highlighting uh, more of his books as we go on this month. But go visit Daniel Kinney and uh, buy his books for your uh, favorite kids, and they will love it. Roy M. Griffiths uh, has a new book, Bringing the Fire, the Lonesome George Chronicles, book two. Uh, Roy is really doing some amazing stuff in speculative fiction, and we're going to be highlighting more of those as the uh, month goes on. But go pick up uh, Roy's newest books. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you're a fan of alternative history uh, or war and military uh, thrillers, you're going to love these books. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, thanks to my buddies Nick and Jason from Galaxy's Edge uh, for sponsoring the show. I would like to welcome back as a sponsor to the show, Nick Breaker and his fantastic series, Essence. Book one, Septima, and book two, Alta, are out now. Nick is feverishly working to release book three now. It's in editing, and you are going to absolutely love this series. Uh, Troy, with his irrational fears, is the least likely person to lead a war but that doesn't mean he can escape his destiny. This fantastic science fiction action series is full of great characters, great character development, lots of action, and lots of weird science fiction goodness. If you love a great character-driven story with great science fiction, you are going to love this series. Essence. Uh, Two books are out now. Book one, Essence. Book two, Alta. And the third book will be here soon. Get into this series now. Everyone's talking about it. Thank you, Nick Breaker. Thanks for tuning in. As always, at the end of the show, we have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with book one, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps 1 find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE Smackdown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now Destiny's calling in a death. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy.
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm really excited to have two authors that I really look up to and respect, and this is their uh, return visit to Author Stories. We had them on in episode 307 uh, back earlier this year in 2018. Uh, The writing duo Nikki French uh, that is made up of the husband and wife thriller writing duo Nikki Gerard and Sean French. Uh, We had such a great time talking last time that when uh, their publicist emailed and said they had a new book coming out. Uh, we said, please let us let us have Nikki and Sean again. So uh, welcome back to the show. It's a great pleasure yes. to be here. Good thank to, you very much for having us. Yeah, good to be here. Well, thank you. Um, you know, last time when we talked, uh, you had a new book out and it was in the uh, the Inspector Frida Klein uh, or, or the, the Frida Klein series, and uh, that that book was uh, the Sunday book, if I remember right. Is that correct? That's right. That's yes. right. Yes. So you guys do this really interesting thing uh, where your books uh, coincide with a day of the week, and that has a uh, an influence on the story. Uh, let's recap for just a second. What was happening in that book, and why was Sunday uh, why was that prominent and what effect did that have on the story? Well, can, can I say first, it's very kind of you to say it's an interesting thing because in retrospect, we think it's rather a stupid thing because, uh, <laughs> because what, what happened, we were, we were quite, I'm afraid quite a few readers got to the end of Sunday, which has a pretty big cliffhanger and right. it's just, because it was Sunday must have been the end of the series. We had some very angry messages. So, we, yeah, so we are series. They're all named after days of the week, starting with Monday, but not finishing seven days later on Sunday, as might be assumed, but finishing eight days later on the book that actually comes out now, which is called Day of the Dead. And it's so Sunday ended with the kind of the, 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 the central character of the series, Frida Klein, who's a, she's a psychoanalyst, she's a therapist, um, but she becomes an unwilling detective in this series of events over these over these kind of eight days. And in Sunday, it was like um, every all the dangers that had kind of built up over the days of the week were kind of coming back to haunt her and were threatening not just her, but those people that she loved the most. And as you see, it, it ended absolutely on a cliffhanger. And that's now resolved. <laughs> in this latest and final book, Day of the Dead. Because probably the point of, of, our, of the series was that the, the eight books each had their own self-contained story. However, for the people who've read the series, there's a thread that starts in the very first book that runs through all of them. There's, there's a, she has a kind of, what she could say, like an alter ego or an enemy, who she, and he sort of haunts her. And what happens in the final book in, 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 in Day of the Dead is where they... The, the long-awaited, at least long-awaited by us, encounter finally comes between them. So from the very beginning, uh, this series was intended to to have an ending. Uh, is that right? That's absolutely right. So we always knew it was going to be an eight-book series, and we always knew that there was a particular overarching story that was set off in the first book, Blue Monday, and that then kind of ran through like a kind of dark thread through all the other stories so each each book is a standalone thriller but also each book is contained in this kind of overarching story which is the story of of the kind of terrible struggle really between Frida Klein and and this kind of slightly ghostly figure who she encounters in the first book and who haunts her and stalks her and loves her and hates her through the following books who's called Dean Reeve, and who re-emerges kind of fully in the eighth book. So we all, we, although with each, with each novel that we wrote, we didn't know what each self-contained story was that we were going to be writing in the series, but we always knew the biggest story, which was the story between Frida and Dean. And because we also really knew it was, that for Frida as a character, it wasn't a character we felt it could go on and on. I mean, the, in a way, the point of her is she's someone who doesn't want to be a detective. She's, she's a, as Nikki said, she's a therapist and she's, she believes in solving problems inside people's heads. And the such a constant drama was to, just to drag her out of her consulting room and into the awful world where she discovers her a sort of horrible gift for 
for solving crime. But she keeps trying to resist that. And we thought we could keep that tension going for eight books. But we couldn't. After like 35 books with her being solving crimes, it would have become ridiculous of her not wanting to be a detective anymore. You know, this is, this is, we really felt that that was we, right from the beginning. That we felt it had to be a limited, a limited story. So we, I mean, we, we, we've loved Frida and readers have loved Frida. And through the series, they keep saying, oh, let, let her continue. But this is... This is where we say goodbye. We're not going to say what happens to Frida in Death Bed, but this is where we say goodbye to Frida. Well, this has to be a difficult thing for a writer, uh, writers, that uh, that readers do fall in love with your characters, and especially in this genre where we we have characters that that live on and on and on and that by saying live <laughs> on and on that is not a spoiler for this book i i've not read the new book yet i, I don't have a copy of it um so I'm, I'm not spoiling the end of it i don't know how it ends either um but you know what i mean that they, the the yeah. character just you know it, 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 it is always a temptation and the thing is it was a temptation for us sure because, i bet because because we liked her and we found her interesting and she became our way of exploring all the things that most kind of bother us and our way of exploring London as well we saw we started to see the world through Frida's eyes so it was always a temptation but on the other hand we always knew we were going to resist that temptation it's, we needed to let go of Frida while people still wanted her to stay and also She's quite a mysterious character. We needed to get as far as we could with her, but she had to remain somewhat uncanny, really, standing just out of reach. And, you know, in 40 books' time, people might have been guessing and thinking, oh, it's another free decline. And we just wanted to keep her kind of fresh and sharp and different and a bit uncanny. Well, it's funny, though, we talk about falling in love with, with your, your main character. It's like there's also an interesting phenomenon where authors fall out of love with their main character. You know, yes. people remember where Conan Doyle actually got so sick of Sherlock Holmes, he killed him off and then had this terrible remorse. You know, <laughs> I, I think it wasn't remorse. It was like suddenly realising that, the, you know, that uh, how valuable this property was and quite, you know, rather implausibly brought him back from having fallen over the Reichenbach Falls. And, and uh, people may remember that they've read the James Bond novels, but that, that actually at the end of From Russia With Love, uh, Bond is killed, or it's pretty, it seems pretty clear that he's been killed, and again it's brought back. I think it's in "You Only Live Twice." Again, slightly implausibly, but uh, so. Uh, but we, we are, well, actually, we're not saying what we've done, but we're, we're very determined <laughs> that we're not, you know, our story, such as it is, is, is come to a proper conclusion. Well, you know, creating these fantastic characters uh, is really a two-sided coin. On 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 one side, uh, the, the readers fall in love with them, and there's a certain familiarity uh because when uh when a reader picks up a free decline novel they they uh, they understand the bargain that has been made with the writer that they're going to uh they're going to get this character that they know and love they they understand basically how frida is going to operate and and how things are going to go of course the writer you're you're going to throw in twists and turns to keep the reader engaged and guessing. Um, but within the toolbox of Frida, there are only so many things you can do until it becomes predictable, like you said. And even and that familiarity becomes uh, has a tendency to want to become cliche. And and some writers uh, are OK with that and they live within the tension of that, you know, for 40 books or, or whatever. Um, that is so interesting. Yeah, that is so interesting because, I mean, in a way, one of the things I guess that we're saying is that we didn't want readers, we didn't want ourselves to become familiar with Frida. We wanted her to remain unfamiliar. And that's another kind of vital reason why she needed to go at the end of these eight books. And so, I mean, in a way, in a way that kind of one of the things that we've always said about kind of one thing that Nikki French has always thought about life and characters and the human mind is that they never actually become 
predictable or familiar, but people are infinitely strange. Um, and, and, if, and if people start not being strange, that's because you've got tired of them, not because they're not strange any longer. You know, everybody is strange and everybody is a bit mysterious to other people. And we absolutely wanted to keep that with Frida. We, we wanted readers not to know what she was going to do next and what her reactions were going to be. And we didn't know what her reactions were going to be until we until we wrote them, until we kind of wrote through her to find them. Yeah, I mean, I should say that, that there's almost, I mean, for us, because we'd never written a series before, but there's a particular, I mean, and there's a pleasure about throwing a group of characters together and not just coming to the end with at the end of the book, actually following them book by book over a period of time. And, and they do, so they start to interact in a way that you hadn't quite predicted. So there's that side of it. But on the other hand, I, there, there, there certainly is the danger of getting to a certain point where you, you just, it, you know, it, there's like like a treadmill, you know, and and, and it, you know, I think we we stopped what we we felt we were stopping when it's still too soon, if you see what I mean. Yes, either too soon or too late. So better to be too soon, really. <laughs> yes, definitely, uh, definitely <laughs> better to to leave people wanting than. Uh, for people to leave, <laughs> and and exactly. and then you're you're holding something no nobody wants. Um, I've about, about, probably about three years time we'll be talking again and we'll have resurrected <laughs> Jesus Christ, and, uh, and then you'll be throwing it in our face and you know <laughs> <laughs> it'll be called Monday comes twice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nikki, you said something that that piqued my interest just a second ago, and uh, you said uh, when Nikki French. Uh, thinks through this situation or, or Nikki French writes in this way. Um, do you consider working with Sean as Nikki French uh, a different process than writing on your own? Uh, and, and Sean, do you, do you see that the dynamic uh, of you and Nikki working together is different than if, if you create something? It's, do you know, it absolutely is different from working on my own. I mean, there are things that are the same in the sense that when we write, we write on our own, not with each other in the same room. And so we go through that same mysterious process of kind of dropping down under the surface of the self and that kind of straight, that kind of magic business of writing where you're going unexpected places. So in that sense, it's it's the same. But actually, writing with Sean, it's been like the weirdest adventure. And I never, we, you know, we never planned it or set out to do it. But it's been this very strange adventure of kind of creating between the two of us, not just kind of a bit of him and a bit of me, but somehow bringing into being this kind of, this writer who's just not like me at all. Nikki French is not like me. Nikki French has a whole different world of preoccupations. Um, and also, I just, you know, it's, it's been very interesting discovering things about Sean and the way that his, <laughs> the way that his mind. And I don't mean discovering kind of secrets that he wouldn't have revealed otherwise. I mean discovering his secret self, more like, or some bits of his secret self. Kind of how his mind works, how kind of odd he can be, kind of what directions he goes in that surprise me. So it's been very, it's been really startling. And also, it's just been a very, a, a very kind of wonderful, interesting, sometimes alarming way of kind of exploring the world together, if you like. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I just want to say that, that I suppose writing, one of the things about writing fiction is the way you need to f free yourself and throw off your normal kind of shackles of being respectable and, and worrying what other people are going to think too much. And there's something about, I must say, where, you know, speaking just for myself, that taking on this other persona, writing as this strange woman, Nikki, Nikki French has... In a way, I could never have predicted in advance. It does, it does make I feel I become a different kind of writer, and I write in a way that I just couldn't, wouldn't be able to do on my own. And it's and and I don't understand it. There is something very mysterious about that. It is, it is you know, it's not. Sean and I do not write, do not have similar writing styles at all. And I, you know, I do not write books that are like Nicky French and nor does Sean. So it's not like we somehow kind of discovered a kind, a, a kind of a kind of writing partner who kind of rhymes with us it's just something a bit odder do you, uh 
do you guys are are you writing other things that are not Nikki French while you're doing a Nikki French project, or, or maybe now that you've wrapped up the writing of the last one, are you are you writing some different things individually right now? Well, that's a, the, well, that's a good question. Well, for a start, we are just we we're actually just finishing. We're just revising the next book we re- we're writing together, which is not part of a series, which is a standalone thriller. So there's, and I think actually, I think both of us have in different ways have been writing things at the same time. We've all, I mean, in a way, one we've always written separately as well as, and worked separately as well as writing and working together. And that feels kind of important. We have our kind of separate selves, and then we have this strange hybrid creature. Um, what we what we never do. And I don't think it would be possible is to set off simultaneously on a Nikki French and say a Nikki Gerard. You know, I couldn't kind of start one, my own book at the same time as starting a Nikki French. But you can occupy different bits of yourself in writing. And it's kind of a, it's rather extraordinary. It's like kind of different rooms in a house that you go into. So yes. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we talked about Frida and the, the way that she is still mysterious, uh, to the two of you. Um, is that a, was that conscious, uh, an effort on your part to, to stay a little distant from her? Uh, or is this just the nature of who Frida is? She, she, uh, is there to help others, uh, but is not willing to reveal much of her own self. Um, have, have you thought about the, the psychology of Frida? We oh, spent, yeah. <laughs> we've spent eight or nine years talking about almost <laughs> nothing else. Uh, we, I, mean, the, I think that's one of the reasons is why we wrote, did it as a series, is that Frida was someone who we always thought of from the very beginning as, a, as someone who was very guarded and, and in a way very solitary. But of course, if she's for circumstances forced her to not be solitary and she starts to but she tries to, has to help other people and other people help her and you know but, but she the, the, her point was that she's she's someone uh who we we don't fully you know she's a mystery to people around her and to, even to people who know her very well and 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 in a way to us we know things about her that was very once that's that was one reason why we made we wrote in a different way we'd never written before we'd always up to then we'd always written our books in the first person you, you know so it would be a woman saying i did this and this is what i thought and we couldn't write like that with frida because that would be giving frida wouldn't wouldn't give that much away of her we all if we, we were always slightly although we were we were, what, we were following her and following her life we never, we never really showed what was going on inside her head, and that. And be- I mean, sometimes I think we've done this terrible thing because Frida. I mean, when we first thought about it, you know, so she's a therapist. She doesn't believe in being a detective in the outside world. She's rather reclusive. She's self-sufficient. She's prickly. She's damaged. She's honourable. She's a truth teller, and she doesn't like. She doesn't like being. She likes looking at things rather than being looked at. And she likes understanding other people, but she doesn't like being understood herself. And we've, we've been, the, been these incredibly intrusive authors who just won't let her alone. <laughs> and we've been looking at her and we've been trying to kind of get inside her mind and doing all the things that she hates being done to her. Yeah, I think that was one of the reasons almost why we felt at the end you know, that it was time to let her go because she just we put her through. So she's gone through so much in the in these eight books. You know, I think one of the things that it's interesting about writing a series now compared with someone like you know, see, you think of something like the Agatha Christie, you know, the Poirot books. You never feel that Poirot, Hercule Poirot is scarred by having experienced so much crime and seen so much violence. You know, you could read the books in any order. He never really changes or gets older. Whereas we really wanted to show and I think we're not alone in this. I think this is what the way what, what writers and readers expect now is we feel by the end you know, she has she's been changed by what the awful things that she's seen and and some of the awful things she's had to do you know so and we, we, we it's very important for us to show that that psycho, psychic cost of be, you know of being the being the, the protagonist of books like this so in the the uh the writing style, the narration style, uh, you said that, that you guys both like to write in first person, but that was not allowed uh, with Frida because uh, uh, she, she wouldn't give that much. So you're using this, this close third person uh, narrative style. Do you feel in the writing 
that you are uh, like a reporter that's following Frida uh, around and getting glimpses of what's going on with her. Uh, maybe a, a reporter that's that's formed a relationship with someone where they give them just a little bit or, or kind of how do you see your role uh, in the relationship with Frida? Yes. Actually, I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. I haven't quite thought of it, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, in a way you could compare it to think of, think of, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and Watson sort of accompanies Sherlock Holmes all everywhere but he doesn't he never quite knows what he's going to say you know and he's sometimes a bit baffled by him and in a way we're a bit like the like the like uh Frieda's Dr. Watson in that we're we're sort of following her around, her around. I mean, we were very clear that that uh, that compared with other you know the characters we've created up to up to now in the earlier books we really wanted to write about ordinary women, people who are just like, you know, people who felt just the kind of people you might know, you, you, you know, who were like a friend or someone you'd meet in the street. Frida was someone, was someone very different. We were really aware we were creating someone who was more intelligent than we were, you know, and more, and had, was gifted in a way that we're not gifted. So we're sort of, so it was trying to convey someone who she just does, he, she doesn't, she, She's not predictable. You don't know how she's going to react in a situation. It's such a, you know, it's, it is really, and we've never really thought about what you just asked, and which is why it's so nice you've asked us, because it makes us think freshly. And there's a way, I think that if you use the first person narrator, you're kind of asking the reader to identify with the narrator. That's right. what the point of identification is. And I think with Frida Klein, readers... Readers have really loved Frida Klein, have had very powerful feelings about her, but I'm not sure they're identifying with her. I think they, they're kind of wanting her to, they feel recognised by her. So they feel more in the position of her kind of intimates or her friend or the people that she might be helping. So it's a whole, it's a whole different relationship that both we have and that readers then have with her. I mean, one of the conversations we've had about Frida Klein it's a slightly nervous conversation. Is what would Frida think of us if we met her? Oh, <laughs> no. I'm rather worried. I'd be rather worried about that. She that she see through. She me. sees through everybody. That's that, that's her, that's her talent. She sees beyond all your surface defences. I think one right into we, those things you don't want to be seen. Yes, because one of the things we feel is that Frida is a sort of. She doesn't believe in making people happy, but she sort of has a kind of belief that you you need to see the truth about yourself. And some of us don't really want to know the truth about ourselves. So that was so. Uh, so we. So Frida is a, Frida's a, a very. She's a sort of pa powerful friend to have, but she's a difficult and demanding friend as well. Oh man, I, I, I can only imagine what family gatherings are like for for you guys. You're like, well, <laughs> well Frida Frida has already judged everyone in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, do, we do manage to have some when our family get together we do have quite a lot of fun actually I have to say. we're That's not right. entirely obsessed with murder and, and <laughs> horror uh, you, you know I, I love um, talking with uh, uh, with with thriller writers and suspense writer and you know murder novelist uh, because they're always the sweetest people and <laughs> you know, that's, that's a true thing because I Nick, Nicky and I both we, we were journalists when we met and before we started writing these and, and we had right. quite a lot of experience of the literary world and meeting writers and I have to say compared with other kinds of novelists uh, my experience of me because we, we you know tra traveling around and going to festivals we meet. I mean, you know, we meet lots and lots of crime novelists, and they are the sweetest collection of people. They're so nice. I mean, most writers hate each other, and they're very rivalrous. <laughs> and crime novelists, they just help each other. They and do. They're, they're and generous. They're, and very they're generous, generous about punch. each other. It's really weird. Maybe so make clearly they get all their hostility out into the into their stories, and they've just left <laughs> over all. It's just sweetness is left over. <laughs> I, I, I love when a, a gathering of, of those uh, types of writers get together and everyone's trading notes on where the best places are to hide bodies. And um, <laughs> did, did you know that this body would decompose this way if left in a dumpster? <laughs> you know, and, you're, and you're just like, oh, my gosh, this is this is uh, I don't know that I'm supposed to be here for this. But <laughs> um, what do you think it is? Um, that makes us love these kinds of stories and, and makes writers love to write them, but also readers love to read them. Uh, what do you think it says about us? Uh, and maybe it's what you just said, Sean, that, you know, we get our frustrations out 
in this way. Um, and we can sort of uh, play act through our frustrations and uh, and then uh, those things don't surface up in real life. Uh, I, I, I don't know that, that anyone's ever really answered when I ask a question like that. Uh, it, it, it's like no one really knows. We just know that it works. But don't you think there's something enduringly powerful about about kind of safe fear or bounded fear, about being able to kind of have a story that will take us through all the things that we dread the most and find the most kind of upsetting in our lives and come to an end and close the door with a click and it's there safely behind you. So to give a kind of, to give a shape to chaos, if you like, to give a, an ending to fear. And one of the strangest things, which is, and it seems so, has been true, forever and in every kind of place is we think of what are the stories you read to little children what are the stories they love they love stories about witches and forests and ghosts and there's something about there seems to be something therapeutic about we you know the the, the, the best way to deal you know because being alive is frightening you know, there's so much you know the frightening things about being a human being about things going wrong about violence about death and there's something maybe there's something very therapeutic about telling stories which allows us to explore those fears in a way that's yeah you know, as nikki said in a safe way so I, and and it's you know because i think it's, it's re, I, and one of the things that we've discovered but even and re, but, you know doing our writing but also when i read other of all the, the, the fantastic you know crime writing that's going on at the moment is it's just such a rich form for exploring almost any part of life you can think of. You know, all different kinds of experience, different ways of living, different kinds of people. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, and there is just and there is something about that. You know, that thing. Oh my God, are they going to really do that? So is that you know, can that, you know, that sort of like looking at you know, it's like when you know when you you know I'm terrified of heights, but if I go up to a very high place, I have to lean forward and look over. And right. there's like so you can you can do I mean it's almost saying you can you can explore pretty much anything you can be as dark and as disturbing as you want to be and it, it's an incredibly kind of elastic genre like that but there is always this you were talking earlier about a contract with a reader there is always a contract that there's some kind of narrative click at the end to contain it all and it's that containment I think. Well, it's it's probably the the reason why we love uh, roller coasters is that we can be on the edge of death <laughs> yet we're safely buckled in and yeah. uh, there, there's a part of our brain that tells us you, you're strapped in you're not going anywhere um, you know th so maybe it's that same kind of thing it's that that standing on on the cliff like Sean said and leaning over looking but knowing that your feet are firmly planted to where they are yeah yeah, yeah. um. So when you guys started this book, you, you have known all along that this moment was coming. Uh, you've known all along that, that you would have to begin book eight. Uh, was your, your relationship with Nikki French uh, different in the beginning here? Because we're talking about uh, Nikki as, uh, as the other person that, uh, that you two become. Uh, was, your, was the writing of this different and was your relationship with Frida different in the beginning of this book, knowing that this is the end and knowing that whatever conclusion uh, you guys come to, this is it. No, it was really different because um, we, we've never lived with a character like her before because it, in, in all our earlier books, by the time anyone else read the book, we were finished with the character. You know, the character had come to the, you know, the bit of their story had come to an end. We were never going to see them again. And so, but this time, it was, it was, I can't, can't em, emphasize enough how different it was. That, so when we wrote, you know, we wrote the first book, Blue Monday, with Frieda in, and then people read it, and we got people's reactions. So we were almost having this, you know, this. So we we were having, we were both living with Frieda for a long time, returning to her year after year, seeing what should we, what you know, what will happen next, what she need to do next, but also be, becoming aware of how readers felt about her. So she felt much by the time we were coming to, to write this last book, she felt like a real person in our family in a completely different way from anyone else we've written before. So there was, so there was this feeling of, I mean, I say it's like a child leaving home, which I think no, is not, not like a child. <laughs> <laughs> 
a lot of leaving home. I no. don't know. <laughs> but you, there was, there really was. I certainly, when you say one beginning of the book, but certainly ending. You know, the, when we got came to an end, there was a real. It was a real feeling of good of of loss and saying goodbye to someone, and that was, you know, that felt really. I've never experienced that before. So, so what do you do now? Um, do you have an, another series in mind? Uh, are you going to write some standalones? Or are you going to give yourself some time? Uh, so after what, we, what we did, what we did the, the first thing we did was after it was kind of done and copy edited, then we went to, on a walking holiday in, in northern Italy, in fact, and we spent 10 days doing very long days walking and and deciding what the next book was going to be, what the next bit of our post Frida life was going to be. And now we have, and we've kind of, you know, we've pretty much finished the, the post Frida book. And that is a standalone book. And it's complete, something completely different. It is a thriller. I, it's a thriller. It's, it's, it's not, not a rom com. It's completely different from the Frida series and also rather different I think from what we did before Frida so it's like you know the third part of Nikki French's writing life together um so we're just we're just kind of getting to the end of that and after that we don't know yet I we say, don't know I will say one thing because the, 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 on the thought of doing another series the one promise I can make we're never going to do what like what we did with this Kate with this series and where we announced in advance we were writing an eight book series and not only an eight book series but one named after days of the week because that was such a uh, you know I, we were asking for trouble I mean if it had gone wrong after two books and we had and people hadn't really liked Frida or we got tired of her and we'd, on, we'd, ending we'd, on Wednesday. we'd be stuck there on Wednesday and we, you know it been a very very public embarrassment so uh, if we did write a series we'd sort of We'd, we'd dip our toe in the water first and see how it went, but we wouldn't say we are now writing a 26 book series named after you know, letters in the alphabet. And, yeah, which of course Sue Grafton did and, did and didn't quite get to the end. On she ended on Yeah, she ended on uh, yes. Well, that is, that is a, um, uh, a great point that uh, that what if what if it would not have yeah. uh, succeeded yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, right and and I met you guys on on book seven so it was already a a, a wild success and uh, you know everything uh, worked out beautifully uh, but when you began and and you told your publisher what your plan was uh, was there any trepidation there did they try to no. counsel you <laughs> uh, uh, to no, it was completely mad. So we didn't really think, we didn't feel anxious about it, and our publishers didn't. And it was only in about book four or five we said, oh, my God, what are we doing? <laughs> but by, by which time we were probably past mm. the danger point. I mean, of course, one of the things about, you know, the really, the, you know, the great book, the great, I mean, there are lots of the, the about writing, there are great bits of it and they're terrible bits and one of the what the wonderful bits is when you first get an idea and it's just like you fall in it's like falling in love and you think this is the greatest thing and so i think we was like in the we were like in the early you know the first throw of in you know passionate love with frida so we had we'll not just write one book we'll write eight books you know <laughs> and it turned out, and it, you know that could have been absolutely insane but in fact it was it, it, i mean i think to you know, to, to to justify ourselves a bit, we we didn't we didn't immediately we didn't plan eight full stories, but we did right from the beginning have a sense of there was going to be a certain thread that would go right through, and we we had a sense of we knew what the we knew the, the ending that Frida was heading for. So so we always had that. It's like it was like going on a journey, and you don't know every bit of the journey, but you do know where you're going to end up. Well, in a post Frida world, uh, when after the walking holiday that you did in Italy, when you when you come back to the drawing board, uh, so to speak, uh, how do you begin the next project? Do you, because you don't have the the familiarity of all the world building, if you will, that you had done with the Frida books. Uh, so, you know, you've got the the wonder of a blank slate. You get to do anything you want, but also kind of an empty toolbox uh so <laughs> how, how do you begin that process post frida i think that's quite a good title should we title for one of our next books the empty toolbox i think that'd be a yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's yours for free you can have it <laughs> I mean, you know in a way the, you know the, the downside of it was we'd, we'd had a wonderful eight or nine years 
like traveling around London and sort of seeing it through Frida's eyes. And that was wonderful. But we, in a way, there was a, then there was a kind of liberation of suddenly having some completely different, you know, you have a very different kind of leading character in this book and a different group of people and a different. And so there was this, there was actually a sudden sense of, of, of freedom and writing in a different sort of way. So that so there was it was mainly it was mainly sort of excitement actually we had a, we had a really good really good time writing this one I think. Mm, I mean the kind of blank the blank page that you're talking about that's both the terror of being a writer isn't it but also the glory of it you'll be you begin again you begin afresh and some you know and I think one of the kind of most terrible thoughts at the end of finishing a book is will I ever be able to do that again and so there's you always have to kind of you have to find something that you just have to write some kind of, you know, and once you've got that compulsion, then other things follow. Then then you have to kind of work and plan and plot and kind of do the research. But you have to have that initial jolt of excitement when you know what the idea is. And also without giving anything away about the book that we haven't even finished yet. But the <laughs> point, what the excitement, I mean, the actual the story we've told in this book couldn't have been, for various reasons, it couldn't have been a Frida story. It's a kind of plot kind of plot that couldn't be told in the way we were telling a story with Frida. So there, so there was a kind of, so there was saying, oh, you know, we really, we, you know, we, we were trying something, we were having fun in another, in another, in another direction. Is it back to first person? Uh, that's a very good question, and, are, and it's not. No, it's not actually first person. But it's. But on the other hand, it's we're telling the story from a perspective that wouldn't work in a, in a free lift thing. I'm, I think I'm gotcha, becoming, gotcha. I'm becoming very, very irritating. I can't. Give, I think we're in this very strange state. You know, we're you know we're just finishing a book that people haven't read, so it's rather you know. So, uh, so it's, one always feels a bit strange about it until until you, it's sort of really finished off and, and handed to someone, some other people. You say there's a term for it, isn't it? Indirect third. Indirect first person. Is that the right yeah. term? So it's, so like, it's like, like it, you could think it was a first person narrative, but it's not. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and when you release that book. The book follows one character all the way through. So it's like, that. Is... Well, when you finish that book and you come back on the podcast, then I'll I'll ask you all about it. And, and <laughs> you, can, you can give me safe answers at that point. <laughs> oh man, um, the uh, so so let's talk about Day of the Dead, the brand new book. This is the ending of a Frida story. We've uh, we've established that. Uh, what can you tell us about this book? Well, what we can say is that that yeah, that there's she, what she's known. She's had in, the, in Blue Monday. She ran across this. But, you know, the kind of, the vill- you know, if, if I can give away the first book in the series, she comes across this character called Dean Reeve, who who is a, is a, a, a terrible person, a scary person, who, who kind of blames, who sort of blames Frida for what's happened to him, and, and kind of, sort of feels slightly obsessed with Frida. And for the rest, for the, for, you know, for the Very remaining, and, and for the remaining seven days, he like, he becomes like a ghost in her life. Uh, and half wanting to kill her, half wanting to protect her. And Frida, there's always a sense, and Frida always knows that in the end, whatever else she does, she, she you know, they're like, it's like two gunfighters or something. They, they're going to end up meeting. And in the book, uh, Frida, I mean, anyone who's read the, the way, that, you know, without even giving away too much from, the, from Sunday, basically Frida decides Everything she's got to give up everything else in her life. It's about her and Dean Reeve now, and really this book is where the, the two of them are almost spend the book circling each other. Yeah. So she, what she's done is she actually disappears. So she's completed the first bit of Day of the Dead. Frida isn't in it. It opened with a series of very strange events going on around London, which turn out to be connected, um, and only only after quite a few pages do we actually meet Frida and kind of follow Frida and she has a companion she has a little someone who kind of tracks her down and won't let her go who becomes like this kind of guileless witness to everything that's happening so we kind of get access into Frida's mind almost through this this kind of very innocent young young person who's accompanying her and bit by bit you just feel you're getting closer and closer to something to the end, <laughs> it, in writing the uh, 
the books in succession the way you did with the days of the week. Um, was it helpful to you or was it a hindrance uh, to not be able to uh, age uh, Frida and to have, uh, you know, the culmination of life experiences? You, you know, you have you have authors whose um, uh, whose protagonist kind of age through books and and over a 20 year period of writing this long lasting character, they get to have characters uh, develop families and, and, and bring family drama in and uh, and maybe career changes and have the, the protagonist get older and, and what effect does that have on yeah, you know, their, their yeah. physical ability and that, that, was that a, but, but so that's also interesting because actually you know see, although it's not 20 years it is nearly 10 years and it's ten, ten, as a decade in someone's life is very significant especially I mean so that Frieza start when she Frieza when we first meet Frida she's in her kind of mid to late 30s and then she's a whole you know she's in her mid 40s um by the end you know and that's a big significant chunk of a woman's life especially when that woman is childless her niece Chloe when we meet her is a teenager and then by the end she's a young woman and so we do we do age them we don't make you know they don't become kind of that we don't take them through the end, you know, through to being old, but we age them and we, we kind of mess, mess, mess them around like time does, you know. We see how time marks them. So Frida uh, in, in Day of the Dead is just different from the way that she is in Blue Monday. She's kind of older. She's been kind of terribly battered by everything that she's gone through. She's been kind of wounded and marked as her everyone around her. Also, we did want to show that, uh, that uh, do you remember, did, if, I'm sure people remember the, um, do you remember the, the, the Columbo, the TV series from the, uh, from the 70s, where, where the kind of, the fun thing of it was it, it was you had this sort of man in a, in a kind of grubby raincoat, you know, smoking an old silly old cigar, coming in his terrible car, and everyone mocking him, and then he solved the crime brilliantly. And that's, that was plausible for about, you know, when he'd solved like two or three crime, uh, murders, by, by the time that, at the end where he'd solved like 50 or 200 murders and he's still being mocked as this kind of loser, who, you know, who, who, you know, who was a kind of joke figure that, you know, we want, we really wanted to show the effect of realistically, or if you did what Frida did. So one of the things in the, in the last couple of books is in, we want to show the cost that she's actually quite well known. So in the, in both, in different ways, the second, the, you know, the Sunday and Day of the Dead are to hear that you have what, what happened. This fiercely private woman who doesn't want, who wants to be, you know, wants to go through life unrecognised, and people know her. She's people, and people have opinions, and when she attracts the wrong kind of attention in in way in different sorts of ways. So we, that certainly was becoming a theme as the as the story as the story progressed. And we wanted to show she's a kind of celebrity and with and that in a very but in a very bad we want to show the kind of cost of being a certain kind of celebrity. I love it. Uh because that is the antithesis of, of what her nature is. And of course, that's one of the. I mean, I think you know, if you're going to give advice to people, right? Where writing almost any kind of art or films, or but certainly in the thriller genre, is you know, you take a character. People, there's a danger where you create a character and then you fall in love with them and you kind of want to make it easy for them. But it, you, what you have to do is the opposite. You know, you create a character and you make it hard for them. You know, what is the worst thing that can happen to this character? Because that, that's how you test them. That's how you show what they're, you know, what they're, you know, what they're made of. And so that, so the poor old Frida, you know, book after book, we've really, we almost from every kind of angle, we've, we've thrown her different kinds of, you know, terrible problems or get put her in terrible situations. Well, Day of the Dead is the the new book and the final book in the. Frida Klein series. Uh, it is out today when you're listening to this. Uh, we are recording this a little earlier uh, than release day, but when you're hearing this, it, it is available today. Um, and we really want everyone to go pick up a copy of this. And if you've not uh, <laughs> met Frida, there there are seven previous books that you can go get. And, uh, and, and th this is a series uh, that I 100% stand behind. This is amazing writing. Uh, and you know, this is just a perfect thing. So, um, the the book is out today. Uh, when uh, do you have any idea when the the next book will be uh, coming out? In about a year's time, I hope. Got you know, 
it's all goes well. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, where can people find you to uh, to discover more about your work and uh, to, uh, to learn usual, about you? Do the usual stuff. You can look for us on Twitter, and you can look for us on Facebook, and you know. So you can if you read the book and enjoy and it. Yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, if you if you uh, like the book, you can send us a tweet. Or if you don't like the book, you can send us a tweet as well. <laughs> <laughs> but be kind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With, whatever you do, be, be kind. You know, be constructive at least. <laughs> right. But you, can, you can be constructive, but just be kind. Uh, well, if anyone is trying to message me for the next couple of days, uh, I will be unavailable because I'm reading Day of the Dead <laughs> and finding out what's happening to Frida so that I can construct my own tweet. Uh, for Nikki and Sean. Uh, Nikki uh, and Sean, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, I love having you guys here, and uh, I look forward to what's coming up next from you. Thanks so it's much. It's been lovely. It's a real thank pleasure. You. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Midnight struck. The Sandman had come. A few faint notes drifted through the rooms of 417 Gory Brook. The hollow wind testing the weatherproofing, the weak scritch of the persimmon tree against Zeph's window, and the drone of Hedwig's snoring. The old house shifted, creaked, and the shade of Agatha Van Brunt descended from the attic. Rom, she called. The ghost paused, collecting herself on the stair. She passed a mirror, but the glass remained empty, reflecting only absence. Agatha would not have recognized herself anyway. She had been beautiful long ago, and still was in her own mind. Not a toothless and wizened specter. Not a blue chalk sketch of a hag half erased from the blackboard of night. She drifted into the master bedroom, disappeared into a shaft of moonbeams, and reappeared on the other side. She stood over Hedwig, listening to him snore. But Hedwig was not Brahm. She needed Brahm. She slipped through the floor into Zeph's bedroom. She stood over him for a long time, listening to the persimmon tree's weak coffin scratch on the window screen. Brahm? No. This was not Brom, not Brom, her son. But she loved this boy, so much hidden potential. He reminded her of Dylan, her grandson. Dylan had slept in this room many, many times. But Dylan was dead, never to return. This boy, Zeph, was alive, so alive. Oh, would that he might remain so forever. Look at him. Who would consign such a handsome lad to the rot of death? Only a very cruel and blind god. Agatha brushed her spectral lips to Zeph's cheek. He stirred, scratched the spot, and rolled into his pillow. But Zeph was not Brom. Where? Oh, Brom is dead. She remembered now. Brom is dead. And so are Hermanus, my husband, and Hans, my brother, and old Baltus Van Tassel, and Katrina, all dead. Only old Agatha remains, after a fashion, to trouble the world. Her sense of herself sharpened and returned to her. She searched the rooms for the crane boy. She sensed him. Yes, here was the boy, sleeping fitfully holding his animal. She extended a hand as if to reach into Jason's chest and take his heart in her talons. The dog woke, sensing Agatha's presence, and growled. Growl till your voice cracks, cur. I could kill this child myself. I could possess the man or the boy. I could take the butcher knife from the drawer. I could stride through the night in strong male form and dissect this child at my whim. Something struck her. Something blasted her up and away from the boy. She collected her energies again and tried to re-enter but could not pass through the walls. When she found her voice, it came as hollow and cold as wind through a tomb. Who is here? 
Agatha whispered, and her tone might have withered grass. Show yourself. She waited with growing confusion and anxiety. She threw herself forward and battered the door like a tempest. Who is here? She cried. But no one answered. <laughs>